Hallelujah. Okay, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to each one of us in the worship. We know, Lord, in your presence, oh Lord, mighty things can happen. And we pray, Lord, that as many of us connect with you during the worship, that, Lord, we come out of it, oh Lord, more inspired, oh Lord, and encouraged because Holy Spirit, the great encouragers within each one of us, oh Lord. And we pray in each one of our circumstances, wherever we are at right now, at home, or here, Lord, or overseas, Lord, that you would, oh Lord, start to stir our hearts, prepare us for what you want to speak to each one of us here. Whatever, Lord, that you place within, uh, Lord, this message, that is for each one here, oh Lord. Father, speak to us clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, is my slides up? Okay. Is this one here? No? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we are continuing on with the series, a letter from uh, lockdown, from based on the book of Philippians. Pastor uh, Alexa last week completed chapter two, which is great. Remember the title? Stop whining, uh, start shining. Uh, when she gave the title, I said, "Yeah, that's just exactly like her style." Okay, and uh, sorry, we don't have some uh, nice title. We just have something that's called. Nothing else matters. And so if you notice, uh, the songs today are based on the focus on that theme. Nothing else matters. Our focus is there is none like Him. And I pray that as many of us who has connected with the Lord Jesus Christ, know that there is truly nothing, no one else who can touch our hearts except what Christ has done in our lives. Amen? And that He is, you are, uh, He is the hope in which we cling on. Uh, I was joking with the worship team yesterday. That is nice two songs to be placed for a wedding. There is none like you and you are. I'm not hinting to anybody here. <laughs> but uh, it is a thing. And then I find sometimes uh, guys find it hard to be sing because it's too mushy. So uh, in worship leading, we always try to find strong songs for the guys like We Are The Champion or something like that. <laughs> but we don't have those songs in church. <laughs> okay, now I'm moving on. Okay, before Pastor Green waved the flag. Okay, okay. take this statement, keep in your minds even as we go on. Um, Archbishop Ben Kowalski says this, you never realize Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Let me say it again, you never realize Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. And so further on from what Paul has emphasized last week in terms of the scripture, chapter 2 towards the end of it, where Paul reminds them, do everything without grumbling, without whining, you know, without mumbling, you know, because, you know, you have been given that privilege. Yep. And uh, in some of your scriptures, let's read it. Uh, some of you would have in your translation, finally, some, we have it here further. Uh, as pastors, we always joke because when Paul says finally, actually, he still has two chapters to go. So, uh, most pastors say, when pastors say, finally, they're following Paul because Paul says, finally, chapter 3, but he only ends in chapter 4. Okay, so he still has a long way to go. But actually, it means, let me add on further to what I'm trying to say. That's the word, finally, what it means. So further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. In other words, Paul is saying, hey, let me repeat it to you. Let me give you the same example. Let me illustrate to you. Let me tell you one more time. Right? It is a safeguard for you. Yep. Watch out for those dogs. Wow, very strong words, right? I mean, not called anybody dogs before, but Paul says it. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee as for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Paul says, this is my CV, you know. If you say you are very religious, let me show you my CV, my bio data, okay? But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, 
not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His suffering, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Well, a lot of things he says. What is the first thing Paul says? You know, if you look at the scripture, he says, I ask you to rejoice in the Lord. Remember, one of the key things we say, one major theme in the book of, uh, sorry, you went disappeared. Yeah, one of the major themes in, um, in the book of Philippines is the word joy. And you can see that constantly in the midst of opposition, in the midst of imprisonment, in the midst of uncertainty, because he did not know what was going to come up in terms of his judgment. Later on in history, we know he, you know, was let off. Yeah, but at that moment when he wrote this letter, he had no inclination what was the decision given that was going to be given. So he faced uncertainty. He was unsure whether death would come to him. He was in imprisonment. He had opposition from fellow believers who preached the gospel out of wrong motives. And see, as Paul would say, rejoice. And he puts that word just before the other verse that says, be careful of those who will draw your attention on Christ. Why does he say rejoice? This is a very important thing. Because when we talk about joy, when we talk about rejoicing, it establishes a Christ focus and an attitude of your heart. Now, when you are going through certain issues, when you're going through wrong teachings, when you come, when you come against false teaching, one of the most important things is to stay focused on the Lord. And Paul says, hey, rejoice in the Lord. And then he goes on to say, be careful of those people who teach wrong stuff. Yep. So, rejoicing keeps our hearts focused on the Lord. It is the one great thing that the enemy will shut you off. That's why the Bible says, every, every breath, yeah, every, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. But there's only one group of people that do not praise God. The dead do not praise God. They who go down into silence. And when you are dead, obviously you're physically your mouth cannot sing. You'll be silent. But even if you go through a situation, you take it, in that illustration and put it in your emotional, mental, spiritual self. If you go through situations and you are so frustrated right now, I know most of us have been that, and you come to church and, you, and the worship leader says, hey, let's sing He is Good. I don't want to sing. What did you do at that moment? You basically voted with the devil because the devil has silenced you. He has silenced you. The mouth that's supposed to, I raise a hallelujah, right now, I shut the hallelujah. Now, it's a common principle we all know, but we hear it many times, and as Paul would say, I say it again to you, to safeguard you. And one of the important things for as Christians is we never lose sight of joy. We never lose sight of rejoicing. Why do we gather as a church? Yeah? We sing because we are people of hope, not because we've got nothing better to do, and all the musicians have got itchy hands, so they must play something in the latest song. You know, we sing because we have hope. That's the same question that was asked for me when I was in secondary school, when we had, uh, you know, uh, Christian fellowship in school. And I have friends of other beliefs ask, Apalah, you orang Christian, uh, selalu jumat, uh, nyanyi, nyanyi, nyanyi. Right? Why you all nyanyi? In case you don't understand that word. <laughs> Why do you sing? Why do you sing? We sing because we have hope. That is very important. When you gather here on Sundays, when you gather in your cell, uh, connect groups, when you connect, say at home right now watching, you sing because you have hope. The moment when the enemy silences you, he wins. Your mind is not focused on the Lord. Your mind is focused on your problem. Think back when you go through a lot of problems and issues. What do you think about? You think about situations. You don't feel like singing. You don't feel like coming to church. You don't feel like reading the Word. You don't feel like anything that needs to connect with the Lord. So people say, I don't know why God is doing that. Okay, then what are you doing right now? But I don't know. I don't care. So what is your answer? I don't know. I don't care. So what is that focus? No need. When you, the moment you take your mind and your heart off God, I don't know. I don't care. I don't want to know. You, all have, only, you have only one focus that is on the devil himself. In the flesh, nothing else. You know, there's no such thing. I don't know. I don't care. If you are not praising Him, then what, what, what are you centered on? I'm centered on my circumstances. And that's what Paul would say, hey, rejoice. 
And the best person to say is Paul. Because if I say to you, say, Pastor, you don't understand, you're not sick, you don't have cancer, you don't have this problem. But Paul say, hey, I understand what death is because I'm not sure whether tomorrow I'll die. So if you're saying that you've got sickness, you're not sure whether death is going to come, hey, I understand, I'm in prison. The guards can come afterwards and say, your turn. I don't know. You know, I go out there, if they let me go, I'm not sure what others might think because there are a group of people slandering me outside there. You see, Paul understand that, but yet he will tell the church, come on, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Amen? So remember this important thing. When we talk about rejoicing, it is to keep you centered. It is Christ-focused. It is an attitude of the heart. We call that an antidote or a defense against the lies of the enemy, against false teaching. When you are centered on Christ, you don't hear all kinds of nonsense. Amen? And so that's what Paul starts off and say, furthermore, brothers, let me tell you, chapter 1, chapter 2, didn't he say many times, rejoice already? He says one more time, rejoice. Rejoice. Come on, rejoice. Yep. Watch out for false teachers. This is so important. During that time, if you study church history during Bible time, there were many false teachers going around. Yep. Especially this particular false teachers were the Judaizers. Yep. And uh, I like... What is Judaizers? Am I stuck? Okay, I'm stuck. Can you just thank you? Yeah, Judaizers. What is Judaizers? If you study in the New Testament, Judaizers are people who say, hey, uh, remember the early Christians were all Jews. And then when Paul and the others preached the gospel to the Gentiles, now these guys will say, hey, wow, these people, uh, like Alex, he suddenly become a Christian, you know, and he's not a Jew. I mean, we are God's chosen people. Now the Savior is here. Why well, let this outsider now become like Paul? I'll go and get all these outsiders, Sasha, la, and then all this guy, uh, someone change his name, Sean Emmanuel, just joke. Right? Wow! You know that? It's some other place. La. Then, okay, so I'm distracted by rubbish here. Sorry. <laughs> and then, you say, how can you let these guys become Christians just like that, Paul. Cannot. We must tell them the original plan. Original plan, uh, you must go and you must sunat first. Because you must be a Jew before you become a Christian. And so there was this big issue going on in the church. In Acts chapter 15, Paul, Silas, Timothy went there and went to be called Jerusalem Council Meeting. In which in the end of the day, they decided that, you know, you don't need to practice all that was in the past because circumcision of the flesh, you know, is, is uh, now we only need circumcision of the heart, not the circ- circumcision of the flesh. So now you must understand when these guys came into Philippi, Philippi is a Roman colony. There were very few Jews around there. How do you know there are very few Jews? When Paul started the church in Acts 16, okay, he didn't go to the synagogue there, okay, he went down to the river where people were making prayers. In other words, you need a minimum of at least 10 Jews, okay, guys, to form a synagogue. That means there are not enough, even 10, okay, Jews to have a synagogue in town. So the population of Jews, very small in Philippi, okay, that he got to go down the river and see anyone who called them, who are children of God there and try to share the gospel with them. So it is strictly a Gentile uh, town. And so when this church started, down the line, these false teachers come in and say, well, come, hey, brother, you know, I've been a Christian like you, but before that, you know, we are the children of God. And, and these guys were coming and telling them the same thing. And that's why Paul was saying, hey, watch out for those dogs. Wow, very strong words. You know why? You know? Paul was like throwing the very words back to their face you know? because to the Jews, the Gentiles are dogs. Remember Jesus one time was saying, you know, who would throw the crumbs to, you know, the lady? You know, what lady is that? Okay, you're going to read this gospel. Yeah. Because to the Jews, you know, the Gentiles were dogs. Just like many civilized society back then, if you go Chinese, Chinese history in China, I would say everybody outside of the border are barbarians. Likewise, the same thing, you know. Uh, those who come and conquer your land will say, you are uncivilized guys. You are barbarians. Yep. And so likewise to the Jews, we are the children of God. You guys are like dogs. No worth it. Okay? And now Paul is saying, you guys who come in, so-called practices of the law, you guys are dogs. 
Wow, it's a very strong word he used. Dogs, okay? And he says, you are mutilators of the flesh. In other words, these guys are corrupted workers. They want to do something in the name for God, okay? Wow, auto can go by itself. Yep. Now, why is I'm putting all this there? Because in Greek, all the three words that he used there has a very strong k, k sound. So if you say it uh, in, uh, in holy right anger, you got saliva come out, right? Okay. Well, sorry, I don't have this. So if the translate, if you translate this way, you can get a C idea. Watch out for those canine, those corrupted workers, those cut out the flesh. You, you get what I'm saying? Very strong words. So in the original Greek, we, we don't have that, but it has that strength. So it's like you won't say like, watch out for those canine corrupt workers, cutters of the flesh. That that kind of uh, strength. Paul was making a strong emphasis here. Don't let those guys come and talk, you know, rubbish to you. These guys who, in other words, so-called good workers of the law, Paul calls them men who do evil. Those who practice circumcision, Paul calls them mutilators of the flesh. Yep. Okay, they were what? What they were trying to do? They were drawing attention away from Christ. So Paul had to issue a very strong warning. No, 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 no. We don't need the circumcision of flesh. We don't need to go through all this ritual. Now in Christ, you are free. Don't go back to that again. That's why the book of Galatians is for that. Once you are free from the bondage of the law, you don't need to repeat. Yes, we need the law. The law shows us where we are in terms of us being sinners. But we don't go under the yoke of that law. In Christ, we are free. So we must understand that. Okay? You see, in other words, we, what's he saying? Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Okay? So it's important here that we understand this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Amen? I like what this guy says. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Everything minus Jesus equals nothing. In other words, nothing else matters except Jesus. That's what Paul is emphasizing here. You don't need to go through all this uh, ceremonial stuff. Okay, it is gone. You will miss Christ when you get stuck with uh, all these laws that you don't need to practice anymore. In other words, I would have, oh, yeah, you got kids here around today, sorry. But in other words, this guy was saying, you know, we put confidence in that circumcision of flesh, that little piece of flesh that you circumcise, that is the confidence we have in it. Think about that. I mean, you're a doubt, right? Imagine that. These guys are saying, if you're circumcised in the flesh, that is chun enough, really. Then there is power because uh, Jesus is not tlachuku. You need to go for circumcision. That little piece, got him ready. And Paul says, if you have confidence in that little piece of flesh, what's the point of Christ's sacrifice on the cross? What's the whole point? So Jesus... Plus nothing equals everything. And everything minus Jesus equals nothing. Amen? So Paul is saying, come on guys, hold on to your identity in Christ. Yeah, Hold on to your identity. For we are the circumcision, we who worship the Spirit. Let me find the scripture here. Okay, the circumcision of the heart. Okay, keep that in your notes. What did Paul say? Let me read the scripture to you. Um, For we are the circumcision... We who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That is the three things Paul says. That we are now the, the, the new the circumcision. We have now the circumcision of heart. And these are the things that identify us in Christ. Worship in spirit and in truth. And that is so important for us to know. Okay, We are called to worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, we know that Jesus tells us that you know God is spirit. We worship in spirit and truth. Now again, when we talk about spirit and truth, we're not just talking about singing in tongues. So some people say, oh, singing in tongues when it's inside. If I go young, go young like that, then I'm in spirit. Then if I shake more, then I'm more in spiritual. You know, worship in spirit and truth, if you worship sincerely, you worship as the Lord leads you, but it also has to be reflected in the lifestyle that we live in our service. Otherwise, we only come and worship because we like it. And there are people who say, hey, Today got new song, I like it. Next week got no new song, I don't like it. That is not worship. That is worship according to your choice. You see, that's where we mix it up. 
Yeah, it is not uh, hymns, it is not chorus, it is not fast, it is not slow, it is not whether we switch on the lights to darken the whole hall. It is not that. It is our hearts at the end of the day. You see, that's why Christians are very funny. When we go to mission trip and we come back and say, oh, I, oh, I tell you, boss, I want to tell you all, you know, we went to this kampung. Oh, they got nothing, you know, just one light bulb. Uh, and they just hit the tongue, you know, and tell you the presence was so real. I was really good worship. I feel so in the presence of God compared to, you know, our church got aircon all that. Let me tell you, if I recreate the whole place, the church exactly like that place, uh, you will say, why, uh, no aircon? You say, God, such thing. God, such thing. Oh, I went to Africa. I tell you, all those guys were all dancing. I don't know why our church cannot dance. Like you dance la, in church. Right? You see, we, we get that idea that worship, the, the point of worship in spirit and truth is according to what the Word of God says, we must be centered on Christ. Our hearts must be locked into Him. Our spirit must be right with Him. A broken and contrite spirit, God is near to those. And it has to be lived out. We cannot just say about singing and then we live on Sunday and then we live our own lives and then come back next Sunday. It doesn't work. See, a lot of people say, well, on Sunday I sing already, so I worship in spirit and truth. No, worship in spirit and truth is more than just singing on Sunday, singing in your connect groups. It has to do with your actual living, actual deciding, actual acting out daily in your living. That's why worship becomes a lifestyle. Amen? And that is how people, God will see. That's why Malachi... You know, in closest to the Old Testament, God says, hey, I don't need your song that you sing out of your lips because it's not real. I can see your heart. You know, I don't need your sacrifice. You can say you buy from Jaya Grocer, but it was the, at the end of the week, you know, in overseas in Tesco or whatever, you can get those cheaper fruits thing, you know, go and buy cheaper. You know, I don't need the blemish one, you know. You don't want to give me the, the, the real stuff. You want to give me the leftover. Yeah, I, don't need, I don't need that. Yeah, because I know your heart. And so that's a reminder for us. Okay, it also tells us we are those who glory in Christ and Christ alone. So important. In other words, we don't glory in our own knowledge. We don't glory in our own strength. Jeremiah 9 says this. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. And that is so important. Okay, that's what Paul is trying to say. Nothing really matters. Not that riches are not important. No. Not that wisdom is not important. No, no, no. Not, not that all these things are not important. But Christ and God alone must be the ultimate number one. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. We do not glory in anything else. We glory in Christ and Christ alone. That is another sign of the, new, the true circumcision. Put no confidence in the flesh. Yeah? We don't put confidence in ourselves. Our relationship with God, okay, is in Christ and Christ alone. Nothing else. It's not what we can do. Yeah. Uh, I think it's so in dangerous. Let me let me go in passing. Sometimes uh, we get we become Christian a long time, we start to put in a lot of new rules on ourselves that we put in. My wife uh, my wife asked me this morning, Hey, how come you wear so casual this morning? I say it's my sermon illustration. Because I wanna see anybody ask, Pastor Wu, are you so wear so chin chai here? You see? But the problem is when I say, oh, next week some people come in the underwear, I'm sorry. But people will say, in certain places in, in churches, if you don't dress nicely, you are not in the right place with God. In order for you to do serve God, you must do like that, do like that, do like that, do like that. I understand church has its SOP, everything has its own instruction. But when we imply, like, some people say, hey, pastor, how can you let, uh, for example, so-and-so come and say, wear shorts. God is not, uh, God doesn't like hairy legs, no. You see, in order for you to please God, Jesus plus no hairy legs, no shorts. You, you get what I'm saying? We add in all those things. You say, oh, pastor, we don't do such things, yeah, that's why it's so important when we disciple people, you don't put your own story into it. If you are someone who reads uh, the Bible 24 hours a day, you don't tell, hey Alex, if you want to follow Christ, you must do like what I've done. Look at me, man. Look at me. I've been in the church for the last 20 years. I am uh, the head of my department. You know? I read the Bible 24 hours a day. Even when I sleep, oh, my head, uh, you know, like Bruce Lee say, 
the body sleep, but the mind never sleeps. So I read, I know the word, just like that. So you want to be like me, you must. And then when a 40 day fast, you don't fast, uh, Facebook, you know. That one is for the Kuchi Red Plus. You know, Facebook, you fast like me. Sounds like who? Sounds like the Pharisee. Jesus plus Pharisee equals everything. You say, no, 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 it doesn't work in our church. Right? It only works for a certain other place. Think about that. What we say sometimes. It's, not, it's nothing wrong with spiritual discipline, please. That doesn't mean don't read the Bible, don't do that. But when we insist people to imitate us instead of imitate Christ, then the danger of discipling people follow you. You become the sea fool. You know? And the moment uh, you leave church, your gang also follow you. Oh, so and so not happy with Pastor Day living. We also living because uh, we all from the same Kung Fu school. He is from the Northern Shaolin one, Bible 24 hours one. So we follow. Pastor, only one hour, only, compared to him. We follow him. You know, the 24 hours school of Bible we follow. That's the most dangerous thing. When we want to add things into it, that's the most dangerous. That doesn't mean that as people were discipling, you don't tell people to read the Bible. We encourage you to read, you know, you could do this way, you could do that way, you could do this way, you could do that way. Okay, but we encourage you to read. We encourage you to fast, you know. Yes, try not just to fast Facebook. Every time, 40 days, pastor, I fast Facebook. Actually, you can fast Facebook any time of the year. Don't wait for 40 days one. Try for 40 days, fast something else. Cannot not like fast away from your boyfriend, girlfriend for one week. Or, you know, for 40 days. See whether it lasts or not lah. You know, it doesn't last then. Praise God. Something like that, you know. But what I'm saying is like, the other stuff like Facebook or that, you can fast any time of year one. Christmas also, you can fast Facebook, fast Instagram, any time. But somehow, a lot of Christians like to do, oh, Pastor, 40 days, I fast Facebook. Okay. You know, but you can do all those things other times. You know, challenge yourself to do something else for Christ. That is your own challenge, okay? I don't tell you what you do, but think about what you do. But remember this, sometimes we add on our own idea of what it means to follow Christ and then add on to somebody else that they should follow you. Yeah? That doesn't mean that when we can't tell you you should read the Bible. Oh, Pastor, you say you don't need to read. I never say don't read the Bible. And I say don't follow my style. My style is my style. Your style is your style. You know? If I eat like that, okay, and you eat like that, it's up to you. Lah. If you use your leg to eat, well, it's your choice, man. I eat, okay? Second point, the first one, watch out for wrong teaching. Watch out for people who tells you, hey, you need to add extra to make, you know, add something, everything, Jesus will be everything in life. So Jesus, remember, plus zero, he closed everything, yeah? Okay? Sec Paul's first instruction for us is what? Two things, huh? if you're writing down, watch out for those who will draw you away from Christ. If you get to have more rules and more rules and more rules, and you are so busy keeping in the rules instead of following Christ, we got a problem because your attention is away from Christ. Your attention is following rules. Okay? Knowing Christ is the greatest of all. Yeah? Not knowing rules. That's why the children of Israel can never follow the rules of the Pharisees. Never. That's why Jesus said that these guys are a bunch of hypocrites. There's no way. In the end, you will add more rules, right? You will sound like certain other religions you might know of, uh, you know, around us, you know. That in order, it's like, hey, Sunday can work. Uh. Oh, Sunday cannot, Sabbath day. So can, can like that, or like that, leave cannot. That's considered work. Do you know that? For strict orthodox belief for certain people, Sabbath day is holy, no working. Like that, Noel, working, cannot. That's why, remember, say, if your donkey falls inside a drain, too bad. Lah. Make sure nobody go out. Lah. Stay at home. Sabbath day MCO. Stay at home. Don't go. In fact, someone says in Israel, there's uh, some hotel, they have Sabbath lift. In other words, uh, on that day, every button, uh, every floor, the lift will open one. Uh. So if the, if the floor is 40th floor, you stay on the 40th floor, you take a long time to reach. Lah. You know, you're at two bunch downstairs, so you better come uh, half an hour earlier. You know, because of 40, 39, 38. Why? Because pressing is called work. You get me now? 
That's why during Jesus' time, in the end, uh, nobody can do anything. Only those people who write the law can. That's why they say, I am more righteous than all these guys. You know, these guys are all dogs. La. That's the dangerous thing. So, s- secondly, put your confidence in Christ, not in yourself. Yep. Uh, now, remember this now. I know the scripture is really far away. Paul says this, hey, if you have confidence in yourself, I more. La. You know, if you think that you are, these guys come out and tell you, uh, you must do this law, do that law. Hey, I know more than them. Who am I? Let me show you my CV. If you say that you are Jew, I'm not just Jew, I'm Jew of Jew. Yeah? You say yeah, you went to Bible class. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. I graduate, you know, master. La. School of Gamaliel, you know. Who are you, man? If you say you are Hebrew, I am a Hebrew of all Hebrews, man. If you say that you are zealous, I am zealous some more. In fact, I persecuted the church before I got saved. You can compare with me. I am Saul now who is Paul. This is who I am. If you want to talk about religious qualification, then let me show you mine. That's what Paul is saying. Yeah, Put no confidence in, in Christ. Uh, put confidence in Christ, not in yourself. That's what Paul is saying. These guys will say, wow, you know, I'm telling you because I'm in the church a long time. Hey, Paul says, no need, no need. Tell these guys, your Sifu, Paul, is the guy who has been there. I made the t-shirt, not buy any, no. I made it, I printed it. Yeah, I wore it zealously. Who are you? But all these things are nothing, Paul says. Nothing. Now, if you take that scripture and change it to your current CV right now, and I know some Christians do that. Yeah. Let me see. Let me let me change. I uh, okay. I won't pick any name. There's nobody's here. One. I William. There's nobody in William here, right? I William. Been a Christian for twenty years. Born in the Christian family. A church deacon. Teach the youth. Upright and respected member of the community. You know, give to the poor and serve as a family among the poor for the last 20 years, you know. Let me ask you, have you ever repeated or hinted that way to some people before? Especially some young people come and say, hey, uncle, hey, you come to church. Ah? Hey, young man, before you were born, I was in the church. When they laid the first stone, I was the first guy to lay the stone, Hello. Yeah. I was the first elder. I've been teaching kuchirets like you. Don't come and tell me. Come to church. Hello. You see, a lot of times when you read Paul's CV, you say, oh, that is talking about Jewish stuff. But put that in a Christian understanding. Have you ever, like, but then because you want to be diplomatic, you don't say, lah. Then you go back and you tell your wife, this young fella. Want to come tell me in church? Now you're in church a long time. Man. What do you mean? You mean your you mean is your CV is like heh. <laughs> Think about that. That's why man, when I tell him in Tungling, can we just shorten the CV? You know, it's like Pastor Elvin Dan just say pastor currently pastoring this church. Full stop. That one last time all there no use one because all the young fellows there. Who is Raya Bonki? Eh? Oh, he died really. La. They don't know. No. All the young people, I don't know who. Like, if you know, uh, who's that Malaysian? Uh, Elvis? I'm oh, sorry. It's on video. <laughs> yeah, brother Long, remember? Yeah? Yeah, pa- Pastor Christopher's brother. <laughs> that is his brother. <laughs> okay? But think about that. You know, we... Some of the young people, I remember who you host the dinner, asking you to sing Elvis, and some of the young people, who is Elvis? The young people don't know who is Elvis, you know, because they don't listen to Elvis. Yeah, they don't sing all those songs, okay? They don't sing like you are nothing but a hound dog, you know? They don't. They don't know who these guys are, you know? It's the same thing. You know, if you ever start to conquer Concord an, an idea of your CV in your mind. And this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is what I do. And then you go there and say, hey, don't say anything. I know. 
That is a scary thing. That's what Paul said. Hey, put no confidence in your flesh. Yep. Yeah, this is what Paul says. I, this is who I am. Tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew, Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee for zeal, persecuting the church as for righteousness based on the law. Faultless man. Wow, anybody there say no? He says, according to the law, faultless. I never make any mistake. I took the test. 100 over 100. Or 101 over 100, man. I am faultless, man. Wow. Fierce. Think about that. Remember of this one particular person, the young rich ruler? I've done all the law. I fulfilled them. Right? Basically saying, I pass 100%. What is what, what is why saying? Don't put confidence in your background. Don't put confidence in your achievements. They are temporary. Okay, they don't define you. Okay, let me let me uh, quickly go here. Sorry, I saw the flag already. <laughs> there are two things we're pointing out about confidence in the background achievement. Legalism is one word. In this, we try to earn salvation by obedience, and that's what Paul's former life was all about. Okay, he practiced the law. He put everything. He says, hey, you want to talk about the law? I fulfill every qualification. No? Everything that requires, I did it. Compared to you, can I? And so the question for us is, are we obeying God because we, of what we think we can, uh, w- because you think that gets you right with God? That's why you obey. If I obey God, then, you know, I, I'm on the right path with God. You know, it's, it's more on, you know, uh, not because you love to, but because you want to make sure that nothing goes wrong. You know, if I don't obey God, then He's going to cause problems in my business. So I better do that. Then it's the wrong way, you know. Because the Bible tells us there's no way that we can obey God perfectly. Even. There's no way. We will never get to God that way. He must come to us. That's why Christmas is all about because it's our inability to save ourselves. And that's why we need a Savior. God has to intervene by sending His Son so that He will obey all for us and pay the penalty of law. We can never obey perfectly. Now we are free to obey, okay, knowing that we are justified by God and we are not under His wrath anymore. We are under, as someone said, under His smile because God loves us. Amen? The other word is license, okay? Uh, we need to leave behind a worldview of license. You know, the other extreme, one thing I have to do and do and do and do and do and do and do. <clears throat> That's why sometimes people who come out from a certain other religion to Christianity, they are the best church workers, but their ment- idea of serving is because the other previous religion tells you to do is the good work. And so I must do and 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 do. And, do. and for pastors, sometimes what well, they're the best worker, man, anything you call, you do. But their idea of doing sometimes hasn't changed. They do because I'll obey, not because, you know, love. Now the other bunch of Christians, the other end is like, I've been a Christian many years already. I don't have to obey. La. You know, God understands me. You know? Communion time, I come and confess my sins and then the pastor will begin already. Okay? And some people don't obey enough. We think the gospel doesn't call us to live holy lives. So we, as what, remember Pastor Victor G said, we drink too much, we wash things we shouldn't, we say unwise things, we fail to be good stewards. The problem is, we think that certain lives of holiness can only mean for only certain people. That's why some people will tell you this. You know, I just be honest here. You say, hey, you want to be a connect group leader? <sniffs> Pastor, me. Who am I? You know, some Sundays also I cannot make it. And, you know, sometimes I do never pay my tithes. You know, and they are giving me the CV of how corrupted they are. I'm sorry, I'm not talking about this church and some other church. You think about that, you know. Hey, can you serve? No, la, Pastor. I cannot talk very well. There, I'm not so good in the Bible, but you are a church member for 20 years. But you know, I only read the cover and the map only. But I, I, I'm just like, but other people are just first year Christian. Yeah, but you know, la, mm, mm, uh, mm, mm. And it's like Paul is like, Oh, I give you my CV, my legalism part. You want to give me a CV or a license? I cannot, you know, I'm right. Actually, I'm corrupt. You know. I'm actually, you know, la, you know, I, you know, sometimes I also under the table, over the table here and the table. And then it's like, hello, grace isn't freedom to sin; it is freedom to obey. 
get what I'm saying? Grace is freedom to obey, not freedom to sin. Okay, it's a wrong teaching when we say grace now, so I'm free. I'm free to sin. No, it's freedom to obey. You obey because you love Him. And sure, we can never obey correctly one. We might forget to do our quiet time. We will forget to read the Bible, forget to pray. God understands. But don't make it your SOP. La. Yeah? Occasionally, you forget God understands that. It's not like standing there, ruler, and say, hey, I see you now. Yeah, you never read the Bible last week, eh? Right? That's why we must remember, don't swing to legalism, neither do you go to the other end. License or no, no, only certain people can do these things. Paul says, hey, count all those things as loss for the sake of Christ. Okay? Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. What Paul is saying, for the sake of Christ. Wow, how beautiful is it? Okay, Christ, for my sake, gave up His life to redeem me from hell. Now, most people don't really think about that. Okay, and Paul says, Christ gave up everything. Remember the Jacob? He gave up everything. He became poor for me. So he obeyed and took, fulfilled the mission that God has given him, died on the cross, paid the penalty of sin for me. Right? And that's how God exalted him a name above every other name. Chapter 2, verse 1 and 11. Yep. And right now we are called to live to Jacob. For his sake. Why? Because for our sake, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And because for our sake, Christ would die for us, then Paul says, for his sake, for what he has done for me, I'm willing. Okay? I'm willing. I think the challenge is, a lot of Christians like it that Christ gave up for their sake. But rarely are we willing to give up something for the sake of Christ, let alone consider all things a loss for the sake of Christ. Think about that. We like it because Jesus did it all. But we don't like it if we have to give it all to Him. It's nice to sing, you did it all for me, you did it all for me. You know, now I'm free, you know. Now that I am free, I'm not giving it all to you, my Lord. You know, that's why all to Jesus, you know, all I surrender. We only say I surrender, you know. I surrender half, I surrender some, some to Jesus. And all to me, I surrender some. Uh, that's the home version. But Paul says, no, no, I surrender all for the sake of Christ. Now Paul says, I consider all things a loss because, because why? He found something greater. Something greater than all his achievements. Not that achievements no good. Not that your degree no good. Not that riches are no good. Not that all those things are no good. But he found something better. That is Christ and Christ itself. And Paul says, all those things I did before are garbage. And actually, the word, if you translate today, is a word that my leaders and my wife will say, don't say in church. But I will say it in a nicer word that you know. It is called dung. Okay? You know what dung is? Poo. I think you all know the other word. That's us, start with S better. Right? That's what the, it means. Paul says, those things are dung. Poo. Garbage. All my achievement, I show you my CV who I was, what I did, this and this and that. Before the eyes of men, it was wonderful. But before the eyes of God, for me, those things are rubbish, garbage, poo, dung. In other words, guys, you wouldn't want to step into dung. You wouldn't want to step into poo and you wouldn't want to carry that garbage all around your entire life. That's why Paul says, that's why I would throw it away and would say, no to those things, no more. Those things are nothing compared to Christ. Those things are only good for my own flesh. Nothing before Christ. That, that is the thing. You see, when we say that, a lot of people say, oh, pastor, you mean we don't have to study hard? Lah. Don't have to go and work hard? Lah. No. God never said that. But those things that you have is what God has blessed you with. If He bless you with intelligence, bless you with business, bless you, praise God for that. Use it to not just bless yourself, bless other people with it. But it doesn't take the center of your life. It doesn't grip you until, no, this is all of me. If all of us is based on what we have, then our definition of what we have, of who we are, is so small. Because 
our definition, if it's according to God, who we are as defined by God, then it's greater than who we are with what we have. If one day you don't have the car, one day you don't have the house, one day when you're 80 years old, you're no longer a director of a company, then what are you? I'm still a son of God. I'm still a daughter of God. And one day when I close my eyes, I open my eyes, I am still in the presence of my Lord. And that will never change. And that's why Paul says, if in the midst of my serving God, I close my eyes, I'm in His presence. And one day when I'm really old, and they lead me off, and I will be chopped and killed for the sake of the gospel, it's fine because either way, you know, I will be with God. Remember that scripture, you know, that Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Chapter 1. Why did he say that? Either way, it's a win-win thing for him. If I come out of this prison, I will preach the gospel, and if I die, I will be with God. Either way, I win. Either way, nothing in this world can hold me down. Okay? And as Christians, we are reminded that one day you might be in such a situation where, you know, you might do everything around you seems to, in this that's defined by the world, seems to be collapsing. But in Christ, you can stay contented. Why? Because either way, I win. If God is for me, who can be against me? And that's why Paul says this, yeah? I want to know him. And there's no time to talk more about it. True humility comes when you see that only achievement in life that matters is knowing Christ. And Paul ends by saying that I may know him and his resurrection. Jesus says this, this is eternal life to know you, the only true God, Jesus Christ, whom you sent. That's the only goal. This is wholesale, one whole sermon, but we don't have time about it. Paul says, this is one to know. He's in prison, he might die, but the only thing that he would say at his age, at his time of service, he say, I still want to know Christ. I still want to know his resurrection. I want to participate in his suffering. You know, I want to end it well. You know, and, and, and think about that. Sometimes we struggle, it's like, wow, so hard. Lah. 60 years old, very hard to go to church. 70 years old, very hard to do. Paul say, hey, even at my age, even in this situation, I still want to know him because I don't know him enough. I want to know him. I want to get deeper with him. I want to grow with him. I think that's a reminder for us because sometimes, you know, as Christians, when we, I think I said this some time back, we get older as Christians, we spend a lot of time feeding our flesh, feeding our, our emotion, mental, whatever we want, but we feed very little to our spiritual and one day when this body gets frail and all that is physical that we can hold, we actually cannot hold right now. Other people hold for us and wondering what life is all about. And we cannot get ready for the time to cross over to Him because our spirit, man, is not ready. We have not been feeding that person. We only feed our flesh things that we can touch, but we never feed ourselves of the Word of God that will last forever. That we never come to know Him more. So that one day when we close our eyes and we open up, and imagine the person you see, don't look like the picture that people paint. Right? And you know and know in your heart that is Christ. Because you have known Him even right here. Hello? Amen? For to me to live is Christ. Great picture, isn't it? And to die is gain. Now, it's that sort of single-minded commitment that Paul has. Nothing else matters. That drives him, motivates him to serve. And as he serves, he also connects with other people. That's the only reason why we serve. That I may know him. And in the whole process of knowing him, I come to know others, love them as God will love them. That's the only reason. And if you are serving, sometimes you find you are tired. Let me tell you, as Paul would say, that I may know him. When I know him, then this joy will be my strength. And I keep rejoicing so the enemy will not distract me. I will not listen to those lies and say, no la, this one la, that thing la, this thing. No, 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 no. You've done enough. No, 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 no. I want to know him. Because when I know him, then his life will permit others I come take, contact with. And that's the only reason we can serve. Yep. When we lead worship here, sometimes, you know, we want to ensure that we are right. Yep. 
Sometimes as pastor, you say, Pastor, you think you're right. I don't think I'm right all the time. You say, Pastor, you are not right all the time. Yeah, you know, maybe I'm upset with somebody in church, you know, this morning, for example. Uh, right? I, my mind is like, worried. this guy, really, I want to strangle him, you know? There you stand up there, hallelujah! But your mind, is, mm, how many been there before? Tola, I'm the only sinner here. But we all have been there before. You know? But we automatically, sometimes in church, we switch face, ma, you know, like the Chinese face, mask. Hi. Good to see you this morning. And then come down. We all know, right? Musicians, we know. We go, go behind it. What is wrong with the sound system? Just the sound of the music was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's this? Noel, I told you, you're the guitar too loud, ma. <laughs> right? Yeah, Noel will know that. Think about that, okay? This morning, I just close here right now. The Bible talks about this story in the Gospels about a merchant who's seeking precious stones and he found that beautiful pearl that he sold everything just to buy that pearl of great price because nothing else compares to that. The kingdom of God, the Bible says, is like that. Like that. And Paul says, hey, nothing else matters. There are many precious stones around, but nothing compares to this great pearl, this price, this pearl of great price. Now, you have not known Jesus this morning, if you're watching online. I just want to encourage you this morning that Jesus is the only thing that matters. Life is not just here on this earth. It is limited. All of us will have to pass on this world. But where are we passing to? The Bible reminds us that they that have Christ as their Lord and Savior have life eternal, everlasting. And that's life forevermore with Him. And that's why the Bible tells us in His presence, there will be no more pain, suffering, there will be no war, no, not even a rumor of war. In this place where the light will shine forever because the glory of the Son of God will be lifted up and magnified there. That is who we have. As much as we can achieve on this world, those things are temporal. The Bible tells us all the treasures that we have are temporal. All the achievements are here, good for this earth. You don't need to bring to heaven, as someone once said. You know the joke that says that this man who carried before St. Peter, and he says, what is in your bag? He says, my gold bars. And Peter said, why do you need it here in heaven? He says, oh, in case I need to buy stuff here. He said, no, no, you don't need it here, you know. Those things, we use it as our road. We don't need it here. You know, a lot of times we think that on earth, we need to burn those gold bars. But we actually, we don't burn. Nobody, I've never seen anybody burn any gold bars yet. Paper one, yes. Go bars, real go bars, no. It takes a long time. And nobody, the next generation is not so stupid to burn the bars. Hello? They burn paper one, paper one, right? Think about that. You don't need that. If you don't need that, then what's the whole point of collecting? It's only good here. But what about thereafter? And Jesus say, hey, I am that pearl. Nothing else matters except you. And if you are considering a better life, a life that's eternal, a life that is, you know, abundant, then may I encourage you to look to Jesus. Amen? If you want to consider Christ, let's just pray even right now. This morning, you know, if you're watching, you want to consider Christ, you want to make a recommitment to Him, even those of you who are here and those who are watching. I say, let's just pray even right now. Jesus, I admit I am a sinner. I admit, Lord, that I try to run my own life thinking, Lord, that I can do all things in my own strength. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I need you. Jesus, I believe on the cross you took my place, died for my sins, so that I can have life. And today, Lord, I want to commit my life to you. I want to call you my Lord and my Savior. Now, if you are praying, you know, right here or you're praying online on the live stream you know this is what we are saying you're saying Jesus I admit I'm a sinner Jesus I acknowledge I need you Jesus I believe you died on the cross for my sins and made a way home for me through what you've done on the cross Jesus today I call you my Lord and my Savior I commit my life to you and if you have sincerely prayed that or agreed in what I've prayed just now then today we welcome you in the presence of the Lord 
And if you want to know more about Jesus, contact us, you know, on our email. We will reach out to you and tell you more about Christ. Amen. And for all those of us who are here, let's just pray. Father, we pray. Lord, when we are stuck in legalism, forgive us, Lord, when we get stuck with what we used to do, what we had before, what we have done before, you know, what we are doing right now, thinking that all these achievements are great. Yeah, those things are good. Those things are wonderful because we gave our time and our effort for it. But yet, Lord, all those things, oh Lord, as Paul would say, are garbage, oh Lord, in the light of who you are. You know, there is more, oh Lord, that you want to do in our lives than just collecting achievements. Forgive us, Lord, when we, oh Lord, line up all those things and, oh Lord, become proud of what we have done. Knowing, Lord, that we did all those things by the unction of the Spirit, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the wisdom, by the strength of you, Lord, that we could do all those things. Father, forgive us when we swing to the other end, when we think that, oh, it's okay, you know, I can live my own life, let some other people, because I, I'm not so good, I'm not so holy, I'm not so this and that. Forgive us, Lord, thinking, Lord, that now that I'm free, I'm free to do whatever I want to do, Lord. But rather, we are called to be free to do what you call us to do, and not what we want to do. That all, as all things might be permissible, but all things are beneficial. And so, Father, this day, we just come before you right now. Oh, Lord, get our hearts right, get our minds right, our whole being right, knowing, Lord, that as much as we have done all those things, those things are limited, Father, are nothing compared to who you are. May we have a desire to want to know you and know you more, so that, Father, oh Lord, in knowing you, we, oh Lord, understand the same power, the same Spirit resurrected Christ, which is within us, Lord, that we had that relationship and that true Oh Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can do mighty works that will glorify you. Oh Lord, we pray, the oh Lord, that we will learn, Lord, to understand, Father, that some of us might partake, oh Lord, in the sufferings that, Lord, that you would bring across in our lives. Oh Lord, help us to understand, Father, oh Lord, that in all this, we are not alone because you are there with us. And so, Father, thank you for the reminder that in all this put together, we are called to joy in the Lord. Rejoice, and again, we say rejoice. Oh Lord, because He centers us on You and reminds us of who You are in our lives. We thank You, Father, for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. Let's just stand right now. And uh, we don't need to sing. <laughs> yep. And let me do the benediction. Yeah. As you go, go in His name, go in His power, go in His anointing. The Lord bless you keep you and make his face shine upon each one of you and may you have a breakthrough this whole week in all your situations in all your circumstances and all your undertakings this week that the lord is there before you behind and with you in jesus name we pray amen god bless all of you amen wave to the other person next to you and the ashes now direct to you section a section b and c d please sit down first. Yeah.